My name is Fett. I'm the former pro coach of Cloud9 Beast Coast Rainbow Six Siege, your recent Manchester major champions, and I'm here to answer the internet's burning questions about Siege. This is Siege Sport. At Spolsdes619 says, Hey Fett, I'm sure you get dozens of DMs, but congrats on the major. What tips would you have for someone who wants to get into coaching but has no idea where to start? So I have a bit of a weird opinion on coaching and whatnot. I think you do kind of need to start playing the game and getting a basis of the game knowledge in order to be able to coach. But I don't think being a good player or a good even IGL makes you a good coach. I think being a good coach is entirely separate, but starting off playing lets you connect with their players more in an advantageous way. So maybe start off playing in the leadership position and then develop your communication skills to their players, making sure you're able to give them feedback in a way that they're able to digest. If they're not, that's on you. Be hard on yourself throughout this process. And then here comes the most important part that a lot of coaches miss before I even release this. So I released my public portfolio back in the day to help out other coaches and people were copying me too much, but this is such an important part of Siege coaching is you have to have documented work. And mind you, this is old. This is from a year ago. One of what I had with myself for improvement back when I used to coach is I made sure my work looked entirely different every new team I was on. So my work now is massively better than my work then. So understanding how to lay out strats, right? Super important. Understanding analytics, right? Using Google Drive in general, you're using every single tool in Google Drive. Slides for strats, Google Sheets for analytics. Understanding how to match prep against an enemy team and kind of write down what they're doing, breaking down their stuff. Maybe you'll learn how to set goals for your players and kind of manage those goals and let them know how they're doing. Taking notes, introducing concepts to your team, right? Being able to teach, being able to be a professor, but also being hard on yourself. I think a lot of coaches, they blame their players a lot and they don't improve themselves. Oh, an extremely important thing, taking notes during scrims. I think the first way you can start off by doing this is opening a notepad, taking notes in scrims, maybe in my format, fuck it, steal it, I guess. But yeah, taking notes during your scrims and kind of figuring out that workflow for yourself. So yeah, I hope that helps. At MexiaR6 on Twitter says, Fet the Goat, do you have any tips to go pro as a player or a coach? So with any game, you're trying to go pro and you're going to need to climb the competitive ladder. So to reach T1 which is professional, you're gonna to need to go through T5, T4, T3, and T2. This stands for tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five. Tier one being pro, tier two being semi-pro, so kind of like college basketball to NBA basketball, except there's not really a college team in esports, so it's kind of called challengers or contenders for most of the esports out there. Tier three being amateur, but like the tip top of amateur. So this in Siege is often associated with underage Siege, which is because the game doesn't allow you to play pro until you're 18. So a lot of the great players play T3 are typically, you know, underage. And then tier four and tier five, tier five being basically the first league you're gonna start in, and tier four being more noticeable leagues, but not the top of the amateur scene, which is tier three, right? So what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna want to basically do your research on what the current most popular tier three league is in the game. So if I go to tournaments on Liquipedia and I sort by C tier, I see that Xenon Gaming for North America is going to be the best one here, right? Then I can join their Discord and within their Discord, I can find these channels oftentimes that have looking for teams, looking for players, looking for scrims. So here you're gonna kind of basically model your post after one of these LFT posts. Hey, you're looking for team, your age, your availability, your region, your role, if you do have a role, um, your experience, and kind of sell yourself like a job resume to these teams that maybe want to pick you up. You're going to really want to build your connections. And the next thing you want to do is scrims. So the normal time to scrim is around 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern in North America, right? The scrims are usually three maps, so they're going to last you three hours. So if you're prepared to scrim for three hours, five to six days of the week, every single day at this time, then you are already in the first step of going pro. If you are unable to dedicate that time to the game, then this probably isn't for you. It's kind of a harsh answer, but that's kind of the first step is figuring out if you can dedicate three hours a day at the time periods, every single day, almost no breaks, right? Really build stuff with a team, figure out your things, build your connections. And then as you perform at T5, you'll get picked up to T4 teams or you'll move up with a team itself. You know, if you top T4, you'll go to T3. If you top T3, you'll go to T2. And if you top T2, you'll go to T1. Hope that helps. XnoyYT says, yo, I'm a console plat with a 1.1 KD and a 1.2 win loss. I'm looking to get better through coaching. So if you have any spare time to help me, I would appreciate it very much. I might do writing clips later, but as of right now, I'm a bit busy with school to be doing live coaching sessions. That being said, here's my definitive guide on how to climb through the ranks in Siege. 
From copper to gold, all you need to improve on is your aim and mechanics, as well as your gun fighting. So that's crosshair placement, that's understanding your angles, pixel peaks, jiggle peaks, movement, making sure all of that is very crisp and clean. Because that's all you need from these ranks, honestly. Like all you need, to, if you are able to out aim everyone else on the enemy team, you just will dominate every single game. In this rank, you need to start thinking about map knowledge. For platinum, that means find, you know, a spawn peak that you can do every round on every single site, finding a starting layer you can do from the roam, what vert means on certain sites, the default setups for the sites. And then for emerald and diamond to hit champion, you just need a five stack. I think five stacking in this game is one of the most important. It's such a complex game that it ends up being like you kind of really, really do need a five stack if you want to consistently hit champ in like a really fast manner. Um, that's what all the pros do. That's what all my friends do at start of every single season. They just spam five stack until they hit champ in like three days. And then when you five stack, you'll develop communication skills, how to be a good teammate, how to play each roles and play off each other. You develop a lot of the teams you need to be a good teammate in Siege and what's so for. But there you go. That's how you climb the ranks. Atlando2165 says, what is the video called where you teach the peak that Sploit did and how do you spell it? Okay, so I want to show you the Hashom peak, which was invented by a player from the Middle Eastern region. Or not invented, but kind of repopularized. And essentially, you have your psycho peak right which is kind of this lean combination has shown peaking is when you prone as you peak right so you don't actually lean all the way but you prone into the angle really quick and it's easier to do with hold from you can also spam your prone peak really quick i know console player probably recognize snappy for doing this peak and while you can't ads and kill anyone off this peak they only see your elbow so it's really broken in my split video you see that you know they only sees the elbow while he's peeking out yeah so right now as you can see on my screen split stuck behind the a bomb right now within this video we're watching and you can see that Stoppin was not able to hit him whatsoever during this and you can see that this peak he's doing right here is the Hashom peak right he's proning over and over and over and during that gunfight what does stop and see right what does stop and see during this entire gunfight so you can see that while he's peaking this bomb angle he really sees nothing look at that just elbow feet elbow feet elbow feet over over there's no headshot to be had so it's an extremely safe peak and as you can see sploit can almost see the entire rotate when he peeks out so there you go that's the hush shown peak really cool mechanic at nath apex says hi there this might be a bit out of the blue but i coach a different game and i'm wondering if you have any advice in general coaching or focuses thanks in advance in coaching in general i think one of the biggest things is understanding when you're a leader of the team you are a mental pillar so no matter what you cannot fold mentally you cannot yell at your players and you have to give criticism in the way that they can take it. So I'm once again, going to bring up one of my extremely old uh, concept presentations back when I just got picked up in the pro league as for the assistant coach and to Mirage. And here you can see I have so many cultural pillars I established in the team and recognizing that team culture is so important, right? But in general, you know, trusting your teammates, letting them have a voice, I think when people start out coaching, they overly negatively reinforce and people don't understand that if you only tell people what they do wrong, then their mindset is what can I even do right? And they turn into statues. If you ever see a player you're coaching become too stagnant, too scared to do anything, that's often because you're overly negatively reinforcing them, which causes them to overthink. So give them positive reinforcement. Let them know what they're doing right. Don't give them too many goals. Give them one to two goals. You know, keep it really light. Keep it really simple. Break down things in a digestible way and really figure out how to communicate with your players and your own style. But that's what I would say about coaching is just making sure communication and leadership skills are at tippity top. That way you're not the ones bringing your players down, which I have done in the past and I made the mistake of that. And you know, I learned from that. Great question. Oh, I also think there's a clip of me saying a really important uh, value to have as a coach. Take a listen. We're having fun, and because of that, we allow everyone to flourish, right? The biggest thing I want everyone to take away from this is on any team, if you scapegoat a player, you are playing a 4v5. Yeah, so if you scapegoat a player, you're playing a 4v5. No need to explain that. If you single out a player and blame them, they will do shit. If everyone bullies and criticizes one player, they will do shit. Simply put, they will not, you know, get better. So think about that. Food for thoughts. At Teko R6 says, Hey, I'm on a newly formed team that has high level mechanics, but little experience in comp and competitive theory. And I'm looking for tips on the theory side of the game to quickly improve to T3 or T2. So for any T4, T5 team that kind of has a bunch of nasty aimers, but want to break through into higher amateur levels of siege, I recommend learning the defaults. What are defaults? Defaults are widely applicable strats, kind of like the base core of every single site on every single map. So one of the most common 
one widely known default you should know in the game is the Oregon basement hold. We're going to contest bunker with reinforcing these three walls, make holes on this side, rotate here, here, line of sight across freezer holes, line of sight top of this back wall, and obviously reinforce all three hatches. So once it's all said and done, it should look something like this in the game, right? And now you need to learn the power positions of this strategy. You need one player flexing behind here, maybe with a shield in front of him and the closet to hold the front side down. You definitely need one player playing elbow to make sure they don't rush through bunker and get immediate sight access. You need a tarps player to double up countering this bunker spot because it directly goes outside and you really want to make sure the enemy doesn't get in here. And then you're going to have a pillar player and the hallway player kind of flexing and rotating depending on where the push is coming from. So if the push is coming backside, my hallway player is going to come look through these holes and staring at the drop as well as the back stairs. And if it's front side, my hallway player can go into freezer and play in freezer to contest these angles versus my pillar player can come to the hallway and double up on this angle as well, creating a three-way crossfire with the guy we mentioned earlier front side. You might recognize this strat from your favorite streamers playing it all the time on Oregon. And the reason you want to learn default strats and not super specialized strats you get from Pro League is because you don't want to kill your players' creativity in their early stages of their comp career. You want them to figure out how to do rotations, where to make plays, and simply the overly specialized strats have death spots or rotate spots that you simply can't understand and they won't learn the fundamentals of the game through them. Good question. At Dennis Zero says, Hi Vet, I have a quick question about Siege. I'm currently a fragger flex. I want to get out of T3, T4. Can you get some tips where I can start improving myself individually and as a team player? So at a T4, T3 level, I think the main thing you notice in entries and fraggers is obviously their mechanics, right? Just making sure your gunfighting is up to par and understanding that your aim is not the only thing that makes you a player. Gunfighting is, right? So a prime example of this I'm gonna do is Diffusers 1v2 against Liquid to win as the Manchester Major in the semifinals and bring us to grand. So I want you guys to notice how he kind of plays with his bullets to kind of force Lagonus's body exactly where he wants it, right? The kind of pre-fires you saw right there for him to get that win on the round were very, very intentional, right? He's coming here, he kills the first guy, he swings out wide, and he immediately pre-fires this door, kind of preventing Lagonus from moving, right? He then resets and pre-fires the same door, even if Lagonus is not going to peek again, just to prevent the fact from Lagonus to cross to the other side, right? So he keeps Lagonus on the rest of the door. Knowing this, Lagonus now realizes that his options, both from both the pre-fires that Diffuser hit from the left side and the right side, Lagonus cannot cross the door, so he has to push through the door as the fuser time is going down. And because of that, he just needs to wait till he gets a sound cue or a sight feeling that, you know, Lagonus is going to do that. He's going to force him to play around him. And because of that, the fuser swings wide. He waits, right? He puts a little bit of time before he swings out because those last two peaks were immediate, right? After getting this kill on the Warden, he immediately peaks his first angle, immediately peaks his second angle, right? Both locking him out, and then he delays, right? Because right here is where Lagonus will probably be checking this door again. He delays, and then he waits for Lagonus to push out. And it's a huge, huge read. Even the casters know Diffuser's toying with his food, toying with his opponent. And that's why gun fighting is separate from aim. So work on your gun fighting, work on making the enemy dance around your bullets. At Gaspard R6M says, Hello, Fet. I was watching your video, BDS versus Sphere, and I saw that you use Google Slide to make your strat. So I wanted to know if you could send me the slide to your Google strat for fun with the icon, because I think I miss a lot of these. So yes, this document that you see right here on screen, it has everything you need to create your own strats. All the blueprints of every comp map, every single floor of them left to right, top to bottom, and also all the icons. This is right now on my Twitch. If you go to my Twitch and you do exclamation mark blueprints, you will get a direct link to this Google Drive. I made it fully public for you guys to use. And the way I would create a strat with this, right, is I would copy and paste the template slide. I would name it Defense CCTV you know, default, I would bring over 10 reinforcements and I would, you know, start reinforcing walls. I would think about what operators I want to bring. I'm just going to bring this entire top row just for simplicity's sake. I would assign it to each of my five players. I'm only going to put a couple of reinforcements down here because I don't want to, you know, spend too much time just making a strat. But if I'm doing a roam or something and my red player decides to, I don't know, I guess roam with smoke because he's a maniac, I would give him these reinforcements right here. And then my blue player decides to roam cash side. 
I would give him his reinforcements right here. And then from this page, you can pick up your secondary utility that each of these players are bringing. So I would have my smoke bring barbed wire. This guy bring this, you know, maybe give him a secondary operator choice for the roam if he wants to have, you know, if the cap gun gets banned by the enemy team or whatever. And if I want to place utility down on the strat, you also have that, right? So cap gun traps, I could tell my cap gun, hey, I want cap guns right here. I want cap guns right here, cap guns right here. And then that'll give a really nice color coded way for your players to kind of look through their strats. Great question. At Elated Mirror Cat says, I give you a picture of my dog and you give me Arctic Theory. Good trade, no? Ah, that does seem like a good trade. What theory should we give him? Let's give him a really old one. Let's give him the counter pacing rock, paper, scissors theory. This is a really, really old siege theory I'll have. I personally do not think this works anymore, but I think it's a really cool way to get into siege theory. It's super easy to understand. Um, And maybe this becomes a video I do in the future. So I wanna go ahead and screenshot this and send it to him. So there you have it. Hopefully I answered some of your burning Twitter questions about Siege. Hopefully that helped. Hopefully my insight gave you some perspective on how to go pro or get better or other things. I'm looking to make this into a series if this video does well. So if you guys have any more questions, DM me on Twitter, join my Discord server and put your questions in the questions channel. Comment a great question on this YouTube video, at me on Twitter, maybe use Hashtag siege support on Twitter. I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna make it. But yeah, hopefully you guys are having a beautiful day. Stay hydrated and I love you guys. Bye-bye.